You have mics on? Any, any, anywhere you want. On the stage, not on the stage, up to you. All right, one more? I'll be moderating. I, I, I can do that from anywhere. I, I can sit probably over there as well. Rasa, please. One more chair. One more chair. It's coming. All right. Uh, there are going to be two moderators. You're going to be in between them, so get ready. Um, so probably, you know, simple start. Oh, cool. We got some water. Like, I guess free bottles and free glasses. So what's that? You need a microphone? You want people to listen to what you're saying? All right. Uh, Could we get a few microphones as well? That's one. Okay, so maybe before we begin, it would be nice to make like a little intro round. So we no. just brief, briefly remind the um, attendees what are you working and how we'll you are to connected you. to the field. Yeah. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ravi Balani. I direct Alchemist, which is an accelerator in San Francisco and Santa Clara that is focused on companies that monetize from enterprises, not consumers. And we're backed by a bunch of Silicon Valley VCs, Coastal Ventures, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, Cisco, SAP, and Salesforce. And then I also teach at Stanford. So that's my background. Marvin? Um, my name is Marvin Leal. I'm a partner at 500 Startups, which is an accelerator program as well as a VC fund. It's All sharing right. economy. <laughs> my name is Shri, and uh, I'm the founder of the HP's wearables business. And before this, I founded uh, what's called CloudPrint, uh, which is now marketed as ePrint uh, in like 60 million printers and things like that. So. Casual. Both enterprise and consumer. Yeah. So I guess like, you know, the free panelists represent kind of like different areas. So Rivi represents probably the most B2B kind of sector. Uh, with Marvin, we'll try to focus more on the B B2C sector. And obviously, you know, given your background, wearables is going to be the, the main topic. So I, I, I'd love to start with you, right? So, you know, yesterday you gave a pres How many of you were at Tree's presentation yesterday about wearables? So quite a few of you. Um, so we're, we'll try to build on top of that, right? Um, looking into the future, what's coming up? How early are we in? Just like, well, well, in terms of tech trends, you know, I would like to look at technologies that are truly going to change lives. Uh, it's going to disintermediate some of the incumbents, uh, and in addition to that, <clears throat> liquefy industries and make at least like a trillion dollar in impact. So if that's the level that you're talking, you know, you would look at technologies and its derivatives like, you know, Internet of Things. Again, it's like really, really huge. Um, and then you're going to talk of human genome sequencing. You're going to talk about robotics because that can have a vast impact on the insurance industry. Um, and of course, 3D printing. You know, there might be a time when we could have clothing that's 3D printed. And uh, so, again, that's at a very, very high level. So, I mean, that would be my uh, way of weighing technologies, you know, making significant impact uh, to, to our lives. Question to both Ravi and Marvin. Which areas, you know, B2B, B2C, are you most excited about looking into the future? As in, like, this is, like, the industry I want to focus on, like, be product service or, I don't know, even particular companies right now. Like, hey, this is like, you know, going to be hot in the, in the coming years. You want to start? Well, so it, I focus on the B2B side of the business. And so I'm always a fan of the enterprise. I'm a fan of the enterprise because there's so much capital there. And it's a more, it's a more, it can be a more predictable thing to go after. Because if you, have, if you solve a big pain point, there is money. There are customers that are happy to give you money if you go after that. Within the B2B world, so whenever you do this exercise of trends, you're basically taking, at some level, a technology disruption and a market. And when you're starting out, I think it's very bifocal, where you have an initial application that you have to be maniacal about solving, an initial pain point that you're maniacal about solving, usually through some new technology, and then a long-term vision where that technology can be applied to a whole bunch of different markets. But what's happening in... So, I'll give you some ways to make money, and then I'll give you the sexy things All that right. everybody, if, is that, if that sounds good. Because the do. sexy things inspire, and the, the ways to make money pay the bills. <laughs> so a big trend right now in B2B 
is this idea of verticalization, of, of software eating the world vertical by vertical, which is, it, which is actually a fantastic way to make money. So it, as opposed to horizontal platforms, there's a big trend in the valley towards just going after verticals. And it's sparked by, there's a company called Viva Systems that raised just $4 million and basically became the productivity toolkit, CRM, um, all the different software for the healthcare vertical. They only raised $4 million, that's all the cash they needed, and now they're a four or three to $4 billion public company. Oh okay? And it's nothing terribly difficult about what they did. It's just applying cloud software to healthcare. And they just went and they sold the whole healthcare industry. So just pick an industry and maniacally go after it with the sales machine um, and apply basic productivity tools against it. That's one generic trend that's happening in B2B. What I'm excited about Within Alchemist, some of the companies that are the mind stretch companies are, um, you are seeing the enterprise being disaggregated where everything's becoming parallelized instead of serial. And that's happening in robotics where you're having modular robots instead of predetermined machines that can be changed in terms of how you're creating products. It's happening with drones, which are now becoming these mod So we have a company, for example, called Matternet, which is a Greek company. Really? Yeah, Matternet is a company that um, it came out as a Greek entrepreneur, and he is delivering using drones drugs, pharmaceuticals, to the developing world where there's a billion people who don't have access to roads. They're in Nepal right now. I, I, I yeah, they're in the Nepal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a fun one. Um, genomics is exploding. We have a company called Cambrian Genomics, which can actually print DNA. So up until now, you had to slice. DNA and concatenate it together and it would cost about a dollar a base pair. But what's happening um, is, is that you have a bunch of computer scientists who are creating fictitious genomes in silico, in computers, saying if this genome existed, it would in theory create this organism, but the bottleneck has been creating the DNA. We have a, com we have a company that can print DNA. They can concatenate A, C, Ts, and Gs. So their, li their first product is a new life form <laughs> that never existed. So their first product is a fluorescing plant that you can read against in the developing world where you don't have access to electricity. Um, we have a quantum computing company, which is really fun too. So those are some of the mind stretches, but the, the immediate opportunities are cloud for verticals. Um, IoT is huge uh, and it, it affects everything in, 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 from, from sensors to analytics to security in the enterprise space, um, uh, as well as the disaggregation of the enterprise. So the sharing economy or collaborative consumption applied to the enterprise, where an enterprise no longer has to hold assets, but instead relies upon assets that are shared. And what an enterprise in the future really means is a brand and distribution. So those are a couple of things. Yeah. Marvin? Um, actually. Actually, ironically, uh, we do a lot of B2B and B2C, so I think I just told to talk about B2C, but B2B side is like super interesting overall. Yeah. Um, so in re regards to B2C, um, one area that we're really excited about um, is fintech. Um, and just here's my caveat as, a, as an investor and actually as a startup, like don't do something because it's like a trend, all right? That's a quick way to lose money, just as a caveat. So when I hear that people are talking about trends, I tend to invest against that, <laughs> um, just as a, as a general sort of concept. But areas that we're excited about, fintech, um, generally speaking, everyone hates banks, right? And, and I'm generalizing, but in most countries, banks are just horrible, horrible organizations and stuff, and um, they don't provide good customer care, they're bureaucratic, and all these other things. Um, you know, so areas that we've, you know, a couple of companies we're very excited that we've invested in, like Neighborly, which is actually going in and disaggregating like Goldman Sachs, so municipal bonds, right? Allowing governments and um, regional governments, federal governments, basically, in this case, it's regional municipalities to sell directly, sell their bonds directly to their um, residents. That's exciting. That's one that's coming out of our program. Um, Lenda, the mortgage loan area, just massive, massive, it's literally a trillion dollar industry, um, and they just really serve, and you know, take something like in some, some cases, like up to 30 to 60 days to process a loan, they're taking it down to less than like three or four days, as an example. Just taking wow. a lot of these horrible, horrible processes that are like not digital, manual, and just moving it online and digitizing it. And so like, fintech is interesting. I think IoT, as well as um, digital health. I actually think digital health is particularly interesting 
because it's driven by a lot of the growth of the sensors and analytics and such that are coming around, in the, you know, both due to smartphones as well as the watch. Um, really, really exciting area, and also trillion dollar industry, right? Like yeah. huge. Um, yeah, I'd say those are probably the two areas that are really exciting for us. Right. Rasa? Yeah, I was just wondering, like there are, in my opinion, like self-tracking, it's also a huge future trend, right? But it's, it's a lot um, talking about wearables, and it seemed to be like a really hot topic now, but um, there are some concerns, like it's a really chaotic market right now because the consumers are not really sure um, how those wearables could be used. Like uh, the biggest market is North America, right? Um, but the customers, like 60% of the customers is proven that they stop using um, watches or um, tracking fitness um, wearables after half a year. I mean, our attitude that it's, it's very cool to have it, um, it's, it's something that you, you carry future with yourself on your wristband. But how to change the consumer attitude or like what to add to wearables to make them to be used for a longer period of time? I mean, I think there is like a lack of the value proposition or... Yeah. Don't you feel it? Well, I do. And so I think this goes back a little bit to Marvin's point about don't do something because of, of from an external motivation. Um, do something that comes from an intrinsic internal, uh, I internal source. And that's the thing that usually cracks the nut of figuring out the product market fit that will change the status quo. You know, so, so Henry Ford is very famous for having this quote that said, if I did what my consumers wanted me to do, or if I listened to users, I would have built a faster horse. You know, but of course he built um, a car. And there's this old, there's a notion about in customer development in Silicon Valley that you can listen to customer development, really it's looking at user behavior to identify where there are pain points, but not necessarily listening to customers for when you're coming up with a solution that's going to work. Instead, that has to be sourced generally from some mystical place from within and coming up with something that solves that in a way that users don't necessarily articulate that they would actually want, but that when they actually see the product, they use it. So a classic case in point is Nest which really sort of broke, everybody was talking about, everybody's been talking about IoT since the 90s. Like there have been, you know, there have been uh, sensors and, and um, Zigbee solutions since the 90s. But the thing that changed everything was Nest, which was a $3 billion acquisition with a really cool thermostat. And if I told you I'm building a thermostat that people are gonna use in their houses, the same criticism would have been lobbed, that over the last 20 years, everybody's been talking about IoT, but nobody's been using it. The reason why Nest or Fitbit, which was you know, a wearable device that's proven, I think, to actually um, to be addictive and, and sustainable and, 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 and engaging within certain verticals. Maybe Sridhar can disagree. But, the, but, but those, uh, when those changes occur, they usually come from an inspiration from an entrepreneur who, who shifts things. So Nest, Tony Fidel was frustrated with his thermostat. And instead of just um, buying a new one, he built the one that he would have liked. And there was product market fit with him. And then that ended up being product market fit with a larger progressive uh, crowd. And now it's sort of leaking into the mainstream. It's going to be something like that. So there is a known issue that people don't, have, you don't use wearables. If you're an entrepreneur, that issue should not be threatening. That should be an opportunity. That means that there's a problem that needs to be solved. And that's an opportunity to create a fantastic market. It's a great situation to have. And then the question just becomes, then how do you solve that problem? And at Stanford, we would say that requires design thinking or empathy-driven user design. And, um, and, and my only response is, is that it's a good thing <laughs> because there's an entrepreneur that will solve it. I'll ask Free to step in. You've been writing things down. So my point of view, specifically on the 1990 rule with wearables, 1.0 is, Within 90 days, 90% 90 of them stop using it. So that's the 1990 rule. Uh, the first thing that you need to do with wearables is stop worrying about functionality. It's worry about the form, what you wear, you know, empathy-based design. You are not going to wear something that's ugly. You want to wear something that's familiar. So design something that's drop-dead gorgeous to start with. The future of wearables, is it's either going to be gorgeous or it's going to be invisible, nothing in between. 
the first thing that you need to focus, you know, that I'm, I'm a big fan of is let the function enhance the form. I gave an example of this. It's, let's say you're designing a watch. So hold a button on your watch, touch it to your colorful sock so that the display acquires the characteristics, the colors and the patterns of what you're wearing. So people will wear that. So that's, that's number one. Um, in addition to that, you want to absolutely positively understand that fashion is what you wear. Electronics is what you carry. You know, don't mix up the two. Three, you know, you have to be very careful about design rules. What's applicable to a phone or a tablet cannot be used on a wearable. For example, we live in a hyper-notified world. So anytime you get an email, your phone buzzes in your back pocket, you get a notification on your desktop, and your hand buzzes. It's, you know, it's silly that we live in a hyper-notified world. So the wearable, let's say for a smart watch, you have a very small screen, and let's say you're driving. I spoke about it at length yesterday, that anytime you get notified, you actually, you know, you're tempted to look at your watch. It's such a small screen, by the time you focus on your watch and refocus back on the road, you know, it can be catastrophic. So you want to be awfully careful, and very soon, there's going to be a regulatory ban on wearables and driving. So you, you want to be very careful about that. And last but not the least, please use socially acceptable practices. If you want to talk to your watch on a Friday evening, I'm not sure if you're going to get a date. So. Just a quick question. You're not wearing a smartwatch. Why is that? <laughs> well, one of these days, very soon. <laughs> Fair. You want to step in? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to add, add to this. I mean, the only thing I just really say is like really focus on the user and user behavior. Um, the, I would say one of the, and if you want to build sort of addictive products, my you know Niriel, right? You must know Niriel, yeah. He's, I mean, he wrote this awesome book called Hooked. Like, I would recommend anyone who's building, whether B2B or B2C, like, read this book um, because it's... Could you repeat the name? It's Hooked. Hooked. Yeah. By... Near Yale. It's E-Y-A-L. It's an awesome, awesome book. And everybody who builds products actually needs to read this. It's an awesome book. All right. Yeah, well, that, that answers the question because, like, if you look at the forecast, like, for wearables, like, Europe will be the biggest market in a few years. And I was just wondering, like, if we are going to buy it for the fashion or the f for the functionality. And I guess that's, that's a hard question to answer right now. I mean, I think it's both, right? The, the reality is that there is a reason, like, you know, um, you think about Google Glass, right? Like, just, okay, it's not, I don't know, I have so many opinions on Google Glass, I'm not going to say anything. It's just like, um, you know, and you see them now, they're working with, what's her name? Like, the, they're, they're working with some fashion designer now to actually... Oh, yeah, 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 like Diana von First, Furstenberg, right? They're working with her now to refashion glass because now glass is just, unfortunately, there's a term, if you've probably heard this already, it's like you know, Google glass holes, right? Like people wear like Google glass. It's like, um, it's sort of, in the beginning, was sort of popular because it's so expensive and there's sort of this, um, you know, but there's been a big backlash, I think, from the mainstream against it. And I, I think anyone who wears it now is just like, what an idiot, right? Like, um, it's kind of funny. And so I think that's what I worry about with, like, the wearable space. Super interesting, but just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? Or build it is sure. probably the best reason. You know, uh, interesting dichotomy. The consumers, we can say so far, there's a backlash on Google Glass, but from an enterprise perspective, there are several industry vertical applications that's very relevant where people can wear Google Glass. If, if you're an airline mechanic or, or you know, in healthcare, where surgeons have used Google Glass. So that dichotomy exists between B2B and B2C. So. Sure. You mentioned like a slightly uh, point, like US is now, like the North America is the biggest market for the wearables. Know, you know, yes. Europe is up and coming. Geographical, uh, geography wise, right? Are there like different industries? There are, like, are there different trends worldwide that are happening? Or are we talking like, hey, this is like wearables, this is happening everywhere? Or are we still talking like different markets, different regions have different uh, trends that are happening right now? I mean, we, we invest globally, right? Exactly. So I, I would say, generally speaking, like we look a lot of like North Asia, you know, Japan, mm -hmm. um, South Korea, of course, sure. um, you know, China. A um, lot of interesting things, particularly in the mobile, in the mobile mm -hmm. space. I can speak on the consumer side. Sure. Right? Um, that's very unique. I see sort of, 
you know, even though a lot of this stuff is made in China, like the hardware is made in China, still a lot of the trends are still being set really more in North America, sort of Europe, than less so sort of in, in Asia, in my opinion. Sure. Um, and so there are big differences. I think, for example, why like this region is particularly interesting, you know, of just the smartphone, sort of the cost of smartphones, infrastructure tends to be substantially better, right? The infrastructure for telco infrastructure in the US sucks. It's really, really bad. Um, I hate AT&T, right? All those, you know, all those um, telcos. Enjoy. I shouldn't say this stuff. But I just, um, I mean, it's, it's only going to be on YouTube. It's, it's, yeah. it's really, really bad. And versus, say, like in Korea, like you know, I'll, I'll talk about like you know, the basic things of like um, wireless penetration, even like broadband penetration. You know, in the U.S., like broadband penetration is like it's five megabytes per second. In Korea, it's like one gig, right? One to, I think they're trying to do like twelve gigs now. Like just so the things that you can actually do are just substantially further ahead. Um, they've been doing mobile phone payments for almost like seven or eight years sure. now. And so they're just further ahead in certain areas. Right. Riva, you've been like taking teams from like everywhere. Yeah, half of our teams are international. Yeah, there you go. And it's not that we planned it that way. It's just that the, the international and the valley has been built by immigrants. Sure. So the, the one trend that I think is secular over time is, is that the most uh, profound innovations happen from people that uh, leave their countries and come to the United States because of the opportunity and they actually are willing to overcome the barriers to actually do that because they're so passionate. And there's certainly what I would say is that in terms of trends, the, the biggest driver for me is the founder, the vision that's in the founder's heads. And there are certain cultural advantages in, in different pockets around the world. Northern Europe, Sweden, I mean just historically has produced, or Northern Europe has produced phenomenal games it, that, that the US market loves. Um, the top songwriters that make the, the, the hits in the United States, a, a crazy disproportionate of them are Swedish. Um, in Alchemist, we've accepted a disproportionate number of Northern European and Baltic, uh, in, the, in the Baltics we've accepted a lot of Estonian um, companies. And uh, I say that because what I would really bet hard on is the thing that you know that you're good at. And don't second guess yourself based on you know, what's happening else around the world. You can use that as an input. But really, there, all the advantages that have shaped who you are today leverage as an advantage to, for, to inform whatever product you create. And um, Europe has been historically fantastic when it comes to understanding, I mean, you guys all know this, but like, uh, 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 we have ph phenomenal security companies that have come out of uh, the Baltics, uh, phenomenal companies when it comes to communication-driven uh, um, tools of various source, games. But um, uh, there is so much more power and leverage outside of the valley. We would love for you to come to the valley, <laughs> but 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 um, you know the differences are advantages. You mentioned uh, sure. You want to step in? No, I think I, I just want to add. Uh, I just came from India here and right. you know San Francisco, and uh, talking about mobile phones. Um, you know, in, in a country like India, understanding your customer is so important. You you can't take a phone that's relevant to the Western market and just shout in India. Uh, just to give you an example, there are a few problems. You can't get a guy who makes pawn or, or a guy who drives a rickshaw to have a Gmail account, right? So sideloading is such a big thing in Indian phones, right? And so you, you actually go to a local shop and say, I have a little SD card, I want three movies and 500 songs for you know, 100 rupees, and you sideload. Second problem, the ambient noise level is so high, a phone which has a big, big, big speaker actually sells really well. Third one is a phone that has a torch because of frequent power cuts, right? So if you actually look at phones that are awfully popular in India, it might run Android, but no one does registration with Gmail, side loading, uh, a torch, and a really loud speaker. So, I mean, that matters. So geography-specific idiosyncrasies are very, very relevant. Marvin, you mentioned like Japan and South Korea. What are other markets you're like particularly like, excited about? Is like, would you say South America? Is that something you're also on or um, not? As I, I don't focus on that region, no. to be honest. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I think the interesting is South, South America, both because of infrastructure and just um, you know, social demographics and things. You know, young emerging population, I think the macro trends are very good. Um, but the thing is, infrastructure sucks. It's actually is a big problem. Um, and so, 
actually what is interesting is you can do a lot of like arbitrage where it's like you see a lot of clones. Cloning actually works very well in the region. Right? Rocket like, Internet is a well-known company. Yeah, press, um, yeah. yeah, but I mean in the region it actually works yeah. particularly well because you can go and say, okay, we know that the economy is going this way and they need these e-commerce companies or yeah. this type of media company. So there's a lot of leverage you can do for that. Um, I, I think like Scandinavia region is like super interesting. Um, we're under leveraged in our portfolio in this area and I'd love to change that. Um, just awesome design. Sales and marketing sucks, but that's sure. easy to fix. We, that's our job to help fix that piece. Um, but like design is awesome. Generally speaking, like just awesome engineers and product people here. So huge opportunity. All right. Anything else or should we open it up for questions from the audience? Anyone has questions on any trends that are happening outside or inside Silicon Valley. No one's interested in, oh, there we go. That's the first question. Do we have a microphone? There we go. All right, 3D printing. Um, I think 3D printing is really interesting for sure. Um, I'm much more excited about 3D printing from a B2B side, less so on the consumer side. Um, the implications on logistics and shipping and making parts for fact, I mean, just much bigger in my opinion, uh, you know, than it is for the consumer side. But yeah. That's just yeah, we funded a, a few 3D printing companies. We love it. And it's, uh, and it's one of these issues around timing, around, you know, when's the market going to tip and all of that. Um, but it's tipping, so it's a great time to jump in. We have, we have an Estonian company, 3D, uh, a secured 3D, um, which is uh, 16 Estonian engineers, and uh, you know they came from Estonia. They came to um, the U.S. They're like wanted to test out the market. They've just recently closed a seed raise of a million dollars. They're about to close a, a five million more, and um, the it's uh, the the opportunities are profound because it disrupts. You know what what intellectual property means in a world where you can print everything and you no longer need to manufacture it um, changes the whole ecosystem. So there's ways to make money in, a, in in a bunch of different ways in the 3D printing ecosystem. For us, it's a timing issue, which means being very focused on certain verticals that are going to monetize sooner. Going after the higher end, we think is actually more lucrative uh, because there's there, there's a, um, a few deep pockets that will write big checks. Um, and the lower end will become, uh, will also be a huge opportunity. It's just a question of staging that over time. You want to add, Tom? Yeah. There's one thing that I want to say. That's one of the technology that's going to change lives. Uh, you must have seen a lot of buzz, but also reality with printing organs. And that's happening, you know, printing valves. So that's changing lives. That's, that's really huge. And from there on to something what we consider superficial, but it's close to a $4 trillion per year industry fashion, you know, 3D printed clothing and designs using mathematical algorithms, it's already happening in the ramps of like New York Fashion Week, uh, Paris. So it's going to affect all walks of life. And I agree with everybody here. It, it's all about timing and specific industry applications. So. All right. Any more questions? We still, there we go in the second row. Coming right there. Hi, my name is Janis. I'm a product manager from Riga, Latvia. And my question is actually about a trend nobody of you mentioned. It's about virtual reality. I personally think that it's a huge trend right now, right? You can tell about virtual reality, how you see its new startups coming up and... All right, so virtual reality. Oculus, Oculus, and, Oculus <laughs> and all the... Um, I, 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 so I, does it, I, I think it's so. It, I think it's profound. I'm trying to think if I have a, a specific story that would be helpful around this. Um, Oculus has obviously changed everybody's conception about what, how things are going to work, it, from social networking to uh, being immersive, immersive, different immersive environments. Um, I I don't know if do you guys have any. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I have a personal experience, right, that I'm going to share. Uh, it's immense. Again, I'm talking about changing lives. Um, just a couple of years ago, right, I was diagnosed with a massive, massive brain tumor. Uh, I underwent a surgery, it's a 15 inch cutter on my head. And uh, I don't know how many of you know about brain surgeries, have watched one, but the doctors, when they go into the brain, they have an overlay, a GPS machine, 
which basically tells you the parts of the brain they're not supposed to touch or the parts of the brain that gets affected. And for successful brain surgeries, you actually see that this is used in today's surgery. So it's about changing lives, and when you talk about virtual reality, that has made a significant impact. Uh, that's one specific example, a story, as you said. Okay. Um, sure. I think there's a lot going to be huge impacts in, um, you know, for example, training, right? In general, like um, whether it's medical training, um, military is just going to use a lot of this stuff. You know, we have an invest. We invested in a couple of companies. One called Avigan, which is actually mainly more more used in the sort of the sports area or applications. From what I understand, I didn't lead that deal. Um, but you know, I think there's super early, right? You know, is there going to be impact? I don't think anyone, just like 3D printing, like sure. they're not going to argue that there's not going to be impact. I think we're just not sure what the vector is for a lot of companies and businesses and which what the applications are right now. Um, but it's super interesting there for sure. Right. We still have time for the last question, so oh, there we go. Hey guys, uh, Eugene from Texas Startup. Um, so we've seen a lot of disruption in the taxi market with the Uber, Lyft, and uh, especially there in uh, California. Um, what do you think will happen next? So where is the whole industry is going? And let's say, where are we going to be in two years? So we're talking about transportation industry in particular, right? Yes. Or, all right. Any take on that? We should have probably got Oliver on stage. Are you talking about collaborative consumption in general, or it's just transportation? What's going to happen with the transportation market? I guess it's, yeah, just transportation. Just. Well, so what we're seeing now is the, the, the companies that we're seeing in the transportation space is, is what's happening in the US is that there's this intense jockeying for riders. So, for, 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 so you're, seeing, uh, you're seeing startups now that are attacking every aspect of transportation. So in, we have a company uh, in our accelerator that's going after public transportation. So um, it, alternatives to so Caltrain and different things like that. So shared, shared, shared um, transportation and so forth. But the bigger thing is, is that now the bottleneck has been moved to the worker. And everybody's fighting over the worker. You'll have a worker who's both Uber and Lyft, and, and everybody's jockeying to get that person. So um, now there's these met, you know, and sometimes this is a sign when things get overheated, but you're having the, the, the meta collaborative consumption players where like a single worker can have one interface and then work with Uber, Lyft, and all that, and you can have one interface and work with all the other things. So that sometimes is a warning sign that it's sort of an overheated market. Um, but the, uh, I, uh, I think you're going to see the general trend being applied to everything. Yeah, I just want to add to that, right? If you take a few steps back and look at what's happening with the demographics, you actually see more and more people moving into the city, right? If you, if you look at the trend from 1850 to like 2014, uh, we are close to around 60% of the world population living in the city. So in addition to that, you know, the sharing economy, of course, you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts are doing very well and taking off and fighting with the, uh, the incumbents, uh, that's potentially going to continue. But in addition to that, you want to overlay that with semi-autonomous and autonomous driving vehicles. That's basically going to reduce the number of accidents uh, and, and things like that. So I, I really think overlay of like Uber with semi-autonomous and autonomous driving vehicles uh, is potentially going to be the direction the world's going to take. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Like Google, you know, was the big investor in Uber, but Google's also building the self-driving cars, which are probably the disruption to Uber. That's the thing that'll kill Uber. I mean, if there is something that kills Uber, uh, uh, is, is the self-driving cars, where everything becomes an Uber. Yeah. All right, guys, I think we covered quite a few areas. Unfortunately, unfortunately we don't have time for more questions. Those guys are going to be around, so go grab them afterwards. Now we're going to call a break.